my name is Fanula and this is my YouTube. So yeah, so I've never really recorded myself talking at myself before. So this might be shit, but we'll move on. So I am going to be looking at things in history I find interesting. So I finished my degree in history in July of 2020. Didn't get to graduate technically, but like because of coronavirus, like I, I graduated, but not physically. Yeah, I thought that it's been some time that I had nothing to do with history, so I would try my hand at talking at myself and talking about things that I find interesting. I thought that, yeah, I'd record myself and make a YouTube. This is so weird. What I'm going to be covering today is the philosophers, something in history that I didn't really know very much about and thought it might be fun to talk about. So that's where we'll start. Frost fairs happened on the River Thames between 1608 to 1814. These are the frost fairs that were known as frost fairs. That's not to say that these sort of events didn't happen before these dates, but the first known frost fair that was called a frost fair was 1608. The Thames is a river that flows through southeastern England and is 215 miles long. 19th century MP John Burns described the Thames as liquid history. Let's look at what he meant. So from about 1350 until 1850, again, these dates aren't rigid. It can be a little bit before, a little bit after, but we'll go with these like nice 500 year period. The earth experienced much colder temperatures during this time. And this time is now known as the Little Ice Age. Hey, it's still green, they headed north two hours ago. Which was a term coined by the French glacial geologist, Francois Matz, and he coined this term in 1939. Because the earth experienced much colder temperatures, there was a lot more snow and ice and this enabled the frost fairs to take place. The frost fairs were basically a carnivalesque type fairs that would actually happen on the River Thames, like on the river itself. The river would freeze over, people would pile on, have a fair for a few days while the ice was there and once it melted, they'd bugger up again. The fairs happened in about a mile span, so from Blackfriars Bridge to London Bridge. So the main frost fairs occurred in 1608, 1683 to 4, 1715 to 16, 1739 to 40, 1789 and 1814. Again, this isn't to say that these didn't happen outside of these dates, but these are the ones that were recorded in like newspapers and kind of pop culture of the time as frost fairs. So in 1608, the water froze along the North Sea and people would actually go out and walk along the sea to visit frozen ships that had like kind of been stuck in the ice. With these freezing temperatures, food shortages and starvation became inevitable as there was no imports coming in through like along the Thames. They couldn't grow their own food, which obviously they would have because they don't have supermarkets. Oats, grains, things like that weren't growing. Mills couldn't turn because all the water had frozen. And even things like trees that actually, because of the cold temperatures, had split down the middle as if they were struck by lightning. We're talking cold, cold. It was necessary to change the way that people created incomes for themselves. People that were previously dependent on imports along the River Thames now had to find alternative means of making money for themselves. People would hike the prices of their goods to try to make more money. People moved their services down to the River Thames to a frost fair to generate more of an interest in their services because it was like a new location and people were like, it's a novelty. So people would go down to the frost fair and have a look about and see what was there and people could raise the prices of their goods and they would say that they had to be more expensive than their dry land price because they had to bring them down to the river Thames. which to be fair i mean like it makes sense like they've got like the good decency to bring all their shit down to the river Thames. i can think of some pop-ups that would charge you a fortune anyway that don't haul all their shit down to the river Thames. we're looking at you box park shoreditch six pound for a bag of chips we move on. It suggested that all sorts of attractions were present on the Thames. There were things like barbers, little pubs, fruit sellers. Plus research this, one of my main questions was how no one fell over. All these people, just imagine there's like tons and tons of people all going down onto this one ice sheet, effectively. They're not gritting it because obviously they want it there, they don't want it to melt. They don't have ice skates because these people want to go out and buy ice skates and blades and shit. And I can't imagine their shoes would have been that grippy. Like your, your image of like olden shoes is sort of like fabric and cloth material rather than like big grippy, I don't know what I'm doing this, grippy things on the bottom of their shoes. So how did no one fall? I didn't have an answer for that, but food for thought. 
And Viper Mitsubishi is a proud sponsor of Golden Goat for Hockey. So there were some types of ice skates, but as I said, it's not going to be that everyone has these. But I thought it'd be interesting to mention that there were some in existence, and the ones that did exist were made with bone or metal as the blade. I doubt they were buying ice skates, but just to say that they did have them, they're made out of more like bone material than of metal. In 1683 to 4, the second frost fire occurred. This frost was particularly revered as a very fun and big one. This frost fair lasted a particularly long time. It was from December 20th to February 6th, um, over from 1683 to 1684. This one was a bit more wild than the first one in 1608. The 1608 one was kind of like the beta version of it. And this is the live version of it. I don't know if that makes sense. King Charles II and his entourage are reported to have gone to this particular frost fair. And there is evidence of their attendance. They had like a kind of ticket stub for when they attended with his fame on it and they were all his little friends. They all went down, had a great time. That ticket still exists today. A lot of people think it's really interesting, the fact that he'd have been given that and he's touched it, put it in his pocket. It's still here for us 350 plus years later. This particular frost fair got a bit more wild, as I've said. They had more illegal activities there as well as like um, the fruit sellers and things like that. So they had bull baiting and they had throwing at cocks. They basically tied up a chicken and threw stuff at the chicken until it died. I mean, there's not much going on, but sure there's better things to do than that. In the late 17th and early 18th century, social critics as well as London City and Middlesex County officials condemned the frost fairs as well as any kind of similar carnivalesque type event. They deemed these meetings to be socially destructive. Others thought of fairs and carnivals as a type of safety valve, like a sort of release from like the day-to-day -day life of these people. If they had a structured, you know, few days they could go wild and then go back to their average working lives insert a joke about capitalism here. Apart from getting boozy haircuts, one of the many fun things people could do at these fairs was visit the printing presses. Printed mementos, um, they were more common at the 1814 fair than any of the previous fairs. Obviously, as I've said, you know, they did still print tickets, they did still print people's names on things, and for a largely illiterate population, they really enjoyed having their name on something because they couldn't write it themselves. At the 1814 one, you get your name not just on a ticket, you get it written on just a piece of paper with a border or a picture, there could be a verse on it, all sorts of fun things on paper. They would buy this keepsake with their name, the date and time that they attended the fair and what fair they attended. Yeah, you can't get anything you wanted on them, it just depends how fancy you were feeling. Some of the keepsakes from the 1739 fair were actually sold quite recently in Belfast in 2019. One particular piece went for 1,500. The last frost fair in 1814 was the largest frost fair on record, but only lasted five days. Thousands attended each day though, so we had a lot of people just in a short amount of time. One thing I found particularly interesting about this fair was the fact they had an elephant. They brought an elephant onto the ice and walked up and down that mile. How strong is the ice that an elephant and a thousand people say were on the ice at the same time is one mile? I don't know if I believe it. But yeah, I mean, it, it was said that there was an elephant there. At this 1814 fair, one of the main staples of food and drink was gingerbread and gin. <laughs> There's actually still a piece of gingerbread that was sold in 1814 at this fair in the Museum of London. Frost fairs have been in popular media. The atmosphere of the 1608 Frost Fair was imagined by Virginia Woolf in her satirical 1928 novel Orlando. Obviously, there's contemporaneous literature and art that was made at the time by people such as John Gay. Gay, born in 1685 and died in 1732, wrote this poem with reference to Doll, the apple seller, who was present at a frost fair in 1714 and supposedly slipped beneath the ice and died. Obviously, the thing is, it's not like the health and safety regulations. They would just turn up on the ice. It's not an official thing. Um, and there was no kind of set date as to how long they could stay on the ice, no risk assessment of the ice cracking and people falling in. So it did happen. It's not like a major factor of the frost fair, but it did happen, you know, to some people. As soon as people start seeing the ice cracking and stuff, they'd be off. This could never happen now. Even if we had these temperatures, could you imagine the carnage? Absolutely not. Like, you know, like Winter Wonderland, how like chaotic and stressful that is. High Park is lovely at that time. Little people everywhere <laughs> but chaos and expensive 
so it seems we'd never get to experience a frost fair now not just because of health and safety regulations but also a number of other reasons so in 1831 the new london bridge was built this replaced the old london bridge and allowed for more water to flow through which meant that the tide flowed more freely and quickly and ice was less likely to build up due to the fast flowing nature of the river climate change has also seen an increase in temperatures this kind of occurred from that 1850 period some say 1870 is when the temperatures started to make a dramatic increase but a lot of that again is pinned down to the industrial revolution more emissions happening um, from factories like it's warmer and yeah that was a very brief overview of the frost fairs i don't really know if i said anything but it's my first one and so i tried if you liked it <laughs> thumbs up um, but yeah, I will be trying to make more of these. If you want to see any of the links that I use to research, I'll put them all down below. A few of them I got off JSTOR, which if you go to uni or anything like that, you'd have free access to that anyway. Um, if not, I think you get like five free reads a month, I think. If you're signing with like your Google account, you get five free at least. And that's it for today. So thank you for watching.